I'm Wanda Myla, and I am a part of the Amherst class of 1987, and we're, hooray! Yay! And uh, we're proud to be a part of the sort of discourse that we'll have together in addition to lots of fun. Um, I, I'm happy to be the moderator for the social reform, social justice discussion, and um, it highlights the work and life and ambitions and goals of uh, sort of improving the health and lives and experiences of people around the globe. And uh, so I'll just say briefly, you, we have bios um, that we've shared with you, so we don't necessarily have to go through all of our life story. I know you really want to hear seven life stories. Um, but since Amherst, I really thought I was an English major here. I thought I was going to teach and write, and a funny thing happened on the way to teaching and writing. Uh, when I went back to Philadelphia, I worked in a women's health organization and really reckoned back to uh, my experience with my father and mother, who my father was a minister, and he, in his midlife crisis, instead of a trans am or whatever, he decided to become a minister. And he, uh, we had a church in Germantown, Philadelphia, and uh, so he chose, uh, he and my mother chose a faith-based context for supporting and caring for and providing opportunities for kids and families in a very poor community in Philadelphia. And so I guess part of the, my journey was sort of having that experience reawakened in a slightly different way and moving not just uh, from William, w w women's health, but also moving to the opportunity to work in dispossessed communities throughout Philly and then over time nationally. Um, my, my primary work in the last 10 years has been around child welfare, foster care, prevention, um, and working with communities to determine solutions around helping fam vulnerable families create stability and uh, permanency and safety and care for their kids. One of the things I've learned all through my life is that uh, while many of us at any point in our life need help, people also bring strengths no matter what their life circumstances are. And that in the opportunity to both give and serve, we are also taught and uh, supported by the very folks that we are working with. So it's been an interesting journey and I'm really proud that I'm gonna share this stage for the next seven hours with, uh, <laughs> with my colleagues here from, from the class of 1987. Um, I think that, the, you know, I'm gonna be a moderator if there are things that come up um, in areas of my expertise, expertise, I'd be happy to chime in. But um, each of them are at least in the first part of this session. And by the way, the doors lock soon. So <laughs> you think you're leaving, you're not till 10, I mean till 11. Um, and uh, the one thing I would say, in addition to the Amherst experience that we all have together, and it was amazing to me because we're all from different places and have different um, sort of not just our experiences, but just chose different journeys. But the one thing that, that really connects us is our unbridled passion for all Philadelphia sports teams. <laughs> and it's unbelievable. Eagles. Every single one of them. <laughs> Kidding. Anyway, so we're going to just jump right in. This is a... Uh, the goal is to have, obviously, the opportunity for the panel to sell pieces of their story and the work that they're doing around so social reform and social justice. Um, but we also want to pause periodically so folks in the audience, many of you, I'm sure, are involved in some level of, of work and supporting families and communities. But also, if there's any like questions or things that you were hoping to get out of this session, we want you to be vocal. And we, my friend Katie here, hello Katie, um, is gonna hand mics to anybody who wants to talk once we say audience participation time. Um, we're gonna start first with uh, the first three presenters, then stop, pause for audience, and then do another set. So let's launch in. We're starting with Chris Jocknick. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thanks, Wanda, for putting this together, and all of you for joining us at this early hour. I'm pretty impressed that we got this crowd. Um, so, Wanda gave us six minutes, and that's usually about as long as it takes me just to get through a few anecdotes. Uh, and so that's, that may be all I can get to in six, but um, that's just as well. I, I was going to talk about my work, but then I thought I should talk a bit about Amherst, and um, I realized in thinking about Amherst, how much Amherst has really been there throughout the 25 years. 
and it's not often I really talk about Amherst. So um, I'll spend most of my time on uh, how Amherst has played a, a role in different pieces of this um, journey to where I am now. Um, when I was first when I first came to Amherst, I was uh, completely uh, one-sided. I was all about math and knew nothing about politics. I, at the time, I think Reagan was in office. I couldn't have told you he was a Republican, which was remarkable. And um, I got politicized on the tennis team in my freshman year of all places. We had a very uh, big rift between the uh, right wing and the left on the tennis team, and the debates were fierce. And uh, I became the, the fodder for it. Uh, they were pulling at me on each side, and um, I, I went leftwards. And uh, that was a big <laughs> initial step for me. So the first piece of the Amherst journey was just getting politicized. I dropped out of all the math courses and, and uh, signed up for all the politics. And um, then um, uh, on that journey, uh, Amherst uh, gave us the chance to go to Africa, and a number of us did, Josh and Joe, it's good to see. Um, and that was a, a, another meaningful step, uh, having that chance to uh, spend a year in Africa. Uh, where I had a, a first real look at poverty, uh, which has become a big part of what I try to, try to work on. Um, and even at that, you know, that one little bit of exposure uh, was important because I started realizing that there was a type of work around poverty uh, that I didn't want to be part of, or that I didn't want to spend as much time with, um, which was the delivery of services. There was a lot of, a lot of the work that we saw in Africa at that time was really about um, Saving a lot, saving lives, and providing food, which is critical work, um, but it just wasn't what I wanted to be doing. Uh, and when I left Amherst, I had another chance to work sort of on that service delivery. I went uh, Amherst provided funding so that I could work with the Public Defender Service down in D.C. on um, uh, defending uh, the indigent. Um, and my first two cases, uh, the, these two clients who I got very close to, got 25 to life. And I realized that that was, again, something I couldn't do. Um, even though at that time I decided I wanted to be a lawyer, I realized uh, that I couldn't lawyer uh, in that sort of individual capacity. And so um, I decided I had, to, I, I had to take more of a structural path. I had to be an advocate and uh, went to law school, uh, figuring that instead of uh, being a service lawyer, I would be a human rights lawyer. But I maintained this interest in poverty. And so uh, at law school, uh, I was looking for ways to combine the, the poverty interest, the development interest um, with uh, human rights. And there's a very interesting split in the, in the community of uh, activists uh, that work on rights issues. There's a big split first between human rights and those working domestically. So human rights is gen generally outward looking. Uh, and there's also a big split between the type of rights that human rights folks work on. Uh, it's largely a, um, a practice dedicated to civil and political rights. And uh, my interest in poverty really didn't fit that mold. And so when I left law school, um, another Amherst factor, uh, with a, another Amherst uh, grad, Roger Normand, uh, we started a little group that was trying to fill this space uh, at, at the juncture of poverty and human rights. And that was this group, the Center for Economic and Social Rights. Um, and we did that for a number of years. Uh, it finally became impossible to work with Roger. And I, <laughs> I parted ways. Uh, it was another piece of my little journey. We're still best friends, of course, but uh, stay for it. Roger's saying it was impossible to work with Chris. Right? Yeah. Well, Roger's not on the panel. Today. <laughs> There's a reason Roger's not on the panel. <laughs> That's not true. Roger's been a tremendous activist, also. So um, I did that for a number of years, and I started realizing that as you work on these uh, human rights issues related to poverty, you um, inevitably come up against the private sector and corporations. And my first big issue had to do with an oil company down in Ecuador. Uh, and I realized that all the legal practice I had did not prepare me for how to have an influence over the private sector. So I, I went to Wall Street uh, and tried to gain a quick understanding of the private sector on Wall Street. And then um, I had a chance to jump back into a practice that really combines everything I wanted to do, which was working on these poverty and development issues from a, a, a rights, what we call a rights-based perspective or a rights-based approach. And uh, that's my position now at Oxfam. Uh, and it's really uh, an ideal fit for me. But I'm going to leave it there because I think the uh, Oxfam should be part of the second discussion.
Thank you, Chris. Sure. So Chris covered the whole Amherst thing, so I can fast forward. Uh, this is, I'm Josh Zinner. Um, thank you, Wanda. I appreciate it for putting this uh, together. So, so also, uh, Amherst also had a, a, a big part in sort of directing me towards doing social justice work. And in fact, uh, coming out of Amherst, I, I wor uh, worked as a social worker for a number of years um, and eventually went to law school. And uh, at my first job out of law school, I was, uh, I was representing uh, low-income seniors in housing court, uh, seniors who were getting evicted. And um, uh, one, one day this woman came in uh, to the office and, and she was being evicted essentially as a trespasser from a property that she had owned for, for many, many years. And, um, and, and so I, I went out to her house to sort of dig for papers and this was back in the, in the uh, mid-90s. And uh, um, went through all her papers and realized that she had been foreclosed on uh, and had lost her house, a house that she had owned for, for f uh, more than 40 years, uh, and she was being thrown out in the street. And, uh, and that realization for her was really devastating and, and for me really sort of marked a beginning of a of, of, of work uh, odyssey obsession. Um, and so we started um, sort of investigating and, and trying to figure out what was going on and discovered that there were um, mortgage companies that were really heavily soliciting um, people, especially people of color, uh, for very high cost mortgages in, in, in low income neighborhoods in New York City, um, and where, where I, was, I was working in Queens at the time. And, um, and, and, uh, and we started really pulling back and looking at the, the, the big picture, and it was a, there was a huge pattern of, uh, of lenders coming in into neighborhoods, neighborhoods that had been uh, redlined by banks, neighborhoods that where where uh, uh, where the big banks, where traditional banks had had uh, had really drawn lines around communities of color and and uh, and not provided fairly priced credit there. There was this big vacuum, and into that vacuum came these predatory lenders that were charging people very very high high fees and really uh, really gouging people, getting people into loans that really were unaffordable from the beginning. Uh, and were causing a huge numbers of people to lose their homes, uh, uh, mostly African American Latino families who had owned their homes a long time, um, and so that became a, some something of a crusade for me. And and I went over to another organization and started a, a foreclosure uh, prevention project and worked for a bunch of years um, defending families who were getting foreclosed on. Um, and and it was sort of you know as as Chris was talking about. Um, there's a certain frustration in doing uh, direct services work. There's there's also a huge, um, uh, you know, a huge value in uh, in being on the ground and really working with families, and and it's and it's gratifying, but it's also extremely frustrating because you you get the sense that you know the work you work so hard on a case and it's really a, a, a drop in the bucket. So I spent close to a decade uh, in court defending uh, families who were getting foreclosed on, but at the same time was realizing with, with a few colleagues that we really needed to work on, on more systemic issues and on, on policy issues. So, um, so we started a, a, a coalition uh, around the state of New York uh, of a bunch of groups and started working uh, heavily on, on, uh, on policy issues, trying to change uh, legislation, trying to change regulation, also trying to push um, some of the, the, the companies that were involved in these practices. Uh, and it was very hard to get um, a lot of the, the, the big banks to listen. It was very hard to get a lot of the federal regulators to listen. Um, and, and we see what happened um, with uh, the, the, the whole financial crisis in 2008. Um, so we were, we were, you know, we saw this coming a decade out um, and there's little gratification in, in, uh, um, in, in seeing how it all played out. So the, the policy work that I started doing um, when I was doing direct services work, finally I went over uh, and um, uh, and I now run an organization with a colleague. Um, called, uh, the organization is called NEDAP, and um, and we uh, we are a um, a resource and advocacy center. We're a small nonprofit, ten people, and we um, uh, we we work with community groups in in New York City and low income neighborhoods in New York City, and we work on sort of the range of issues 
uh, around um, sort of the intersection of the where the effect that banks and financial services have on low-income neighborhoods and on communities of color. Uh, and we um, so we work on a lot of issues around lending and foreclosure, uh, abusive debt collection, the effect of, of credit reports, and we look at the again sort of the effect that these practices have on on people's lives. Um, and we do uh, you know so we we do how much time do I have, Wanda? Another one minute. <laughs> so um, we'll talk more about it the second session, but. We do we do a range we you know we try and work on these issues from a whole range of perspectives so we do direct uh, services work and we do a lot of community education um, we do policy work so we we work in coalitions on a whole bunch of issues and we we organize those coalitions and we do uh, we do research and we and we do we try and really put a focus on what the big picture is so we we sort of have a bridge function with groups on the ground. And we uh, and we really try and pull people together, uh, and and really try and focus on the larger picture. So on trying to get regulators to to change uh, rules and laws, and on really putting pressure on doing the kind of corporate accountability work that Chris is talking about, and especially trying to put pressure on on the big banks um, to take responsibility for for a lot of what went on uh, in in uh, and what continues to go on, and 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 their responsibility for failing to serve. Uh, low-income neighborhoods, and and instead um, helping to to uh, to to, to um, uh, fund and to to um, add to to the proliferation of abusive products in those neighborhoods. So we really try and put a, a focus on the big picture and everything that we do. And I guess we'll talk more about that uh, in the second panel. So I kind of took this journey from doing direct services work to really uh, a focus on 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 uh, on policy work. Um, it's gratifying. Um, but it's also important to our work that we're doing work on the ground and working with with, with a lot of groups so that we don't lose perspective about what's going on in in, uh, in neighborhoods. Thanks, John. So I'm Eva Neubauer Elligood, um, and I'll start out by talking about the Amherst piece and sort of how I came to my field, which is. Um, around social reform, uh, it's urban planning and community development. And um, similar to my uh, panelists here, my, my passion for this work started with the experience at Amherst, where I, I, I think the professors really encouraged a lot of deep thinking about what are the systems that create these in inequities that we have, not just here, but abroad as well. Um, I mean, I still think about the work that, that what I learned in um, Amrita Vasu's class and Donald Pitkin, just a, a fabulous teachers that that really got you to think very, very critically about um, the barriers to people's um, access to opportunities. And, and um, I came at the whole question of poverty and social reform from this, I always looked at the world through the physical space that we experience, and I actually um, studied architecture history, and I was always interested in, in um, especially in, in our country when we have such a wealth, uh, that there are neighborhoods that are completely cut off from, um, well, that don't have um, good physical spaces, and side by side with um, incredible well, including the campus that we're on right now. Um, and, and I was very disturbed, that especially going, I'd always go through New York City to go home to visit my parents. And you could walk down the block on Park Avenue and know that people lived incredibly well. And at the end of the block, you, you could not believe the conditions people were living in in our country. Um, and, and, and it was just so apparent from a physical perspective. And a lot of that had to do with um, our housing issues that we have. Um, which Josh works on as well, um, and and I was very, I was very intrigued by the notion that you can use architecture, um, and planning as a means of transforming people's lives of, of of social reform. I was curious about how that could work, and um, and so I, after college, after about a year, wanted to work in an organization that really used architecture and planning as a tool for um, transforming transforming. Um, blighted neighborhoods, because that, that's really what I saw as, as 
really critical um, to address. And so <clears throat> I ended up, my first job was at a place um, called the Pratt Center for Community Development. It's, it's one of the, well, I'll call it one of the last holdouts of a movement that started in the 60s of architecture and planning departments, um, students and professors who press their institutions to be more socially responsible and to give back and to not just be um, in the field of planning. It's often very technical work where you, you know, you crunch the numbers, you figure out where to put the highways and the subway lines. And um, there, are, there are people in the field who said, you know, let's look at the social components and, and how can we work in collaboration with communities, not just top down where you say, here's the solution to your issues, let's come in and put up a high rise to put in better housing, but how can we, we create organically change from the bottom? And so, there, so at the Pratt Center, there were architects and planners that worked uh, directly with community groups that were run by people from, from urban neighborhoods um, that were trying to create change. And a lot of it at the time um, when the Pratt Center was started in the 1960s was around improving housing. And so um, in the second part of the session, I'll talk about sort of, sort of that trajectory and how it's, it's more at a certain point the field realized it needed to go beyond housing and look at all the other issues that, that that are that intersect um, in in the in looking at poverty, um, it's not just about improving physical spaces. But that's always been um, my passion. And um, after working for over six years, am I almost done? Okay, okay. Um, I did. I specialized in an uh, organization that deals with homelessness prevention and stabilizing people who experience homelessness um, through a model called supportive housing, where services are attached to the housing to help people stay. Um, stably housed, and then um, most recently, I was for the first time worked for a community-based organization that does the housing and the services in the community. So I've had that range of experience, but always this intersection between it, it, dealing with inequality, poverty, and um, trying to improve physical spaces. So I'll leave it at that and have more time. Thanks, Eva. So for those of you who've been coming in, just to recap, um, I'm Wanda Mile, and I'm the moderator for this wonderful panel. Um, and I'm a part of the class of 1987, as are my colleagues here. We decided the, the format would be that there would be three folks who would start, tell the story, their story and key points, and then give an opportunity for the audience to either respond, or if you have questions, or if there are things you're hoping to hear, this will be your time and you just sort of put your hand up and, and Katie will give you a mic. In addition, just want to remind you that we have our bios, so you, we won't be going through every piece of our story or our work experience over the past 25 years, um, but that um, we'll be emphasizing some things that matter to us. One thing that's kind of been interesting about this group is that many of the, I mean, so obviously the issues cross fertilize, right? So there's a lot that we are learning from each other even as we're sharing with you. Um, but there is, you know, we're able to kind of go to the micro where it's local and some national work, but we're also, um, many folks are doing work internationally or their fields um, are impacted by also interna international kind of colleagues and partners across the globe. So um, are there folks, is, are there any questions or things that folks want to say now? Oh, I know, it's early. <laughs> Um, okay, so we'll, are you sure? Oh, here we go. Katie! <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, Josh, it's Josh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was curious about the predatory lending that you talked about, and I'm curious about whether it, you, it, you tend to see it in the larger banks or the more smaller community-based banks. And I'm just curious from their perspective, I mean, they don't want to make a loan that is going to default. Do they? I mean, they don't really want to do that. Or maybe they do, and that's my <laughs> question. It's funny is you Maybe they that. just want to take control of the property, and that's, that's their way of maximizing profit. I'm just trying to think of it from the bank's perspective, how we can get them to act in a way that's profit maximizing, but also you know, keeps people in their homes and gives them an affordable way to, to buy that home over that's, time. Uh, the, that's the, the, these are the same questions that we were asked that we were answering many years ago and the banks would say that we go to the banks and say look what looks look what's going on 
you guys are doing loans in, in, in neighborhoods that, have, you know, these loans are unaffordable at their inception. They're causing really devastation um, to communities. Um, and and that they would say the same thing. Why would we make loans that are unaffordable? And the answer is that it's, it's a long answer and there are people waiting to speak. But the short version is that what happened uh, is that these loans were securitized. They were bundled uh, together by, uh, by big banks, uh, big investment banks on Wall Street. And then they were wrapped in, in bond insurance and they were sliced up and sold off as mortgage-backed securities. And yeah, there you go. So that's the answer. So you get out. <laughs> You're in the wrong uh -huh. Oh come on, he should be here. No, so, so I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't. I mean, we can spend more time on that in the second panel. But everybody was making a killing uh, off of the securitization of, of subprime mortgages, um, and you know, at at all levels. The originators, the brokers, and the and the big banks that were securitizing them, uh, and then servicing them, collecting on them, and so the, the you know it was only homeowners on the ground that were getting killed, uh, and you know and fi and finally these were like how these securitization, uh, the trusts were like houses of cards because they were full of uh, mortgages that were really un you know unaffordable at their inception, and and we we knew that they were going to come apart, and and in fact uh, you know they started collapsing in 2007, and it led to the 2008 crash, but uh, but the short version is it was highly profitable uh, to make loans that were unaffordable uh, at their inception, uh, and so there there was a perverse incentives in the market, and it really had a really profound impact on communities. Because they didn't hold the mortgage, because they sold the mortgage. There was instead of an incentive to create a good product, which was an affordable mortgage, there was an incentive to take make any kind of mortgage possible, and so they were really aggressively push marketing. Uh, mortgages, whether they were affordable or not, based on false income, and 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 just trying to make as many mortgages as possible to make a, a killing, and it, uh, you know, and that and that happened in the trillions. Is there anybody else on the panel who also wants to speak to this? Chris, do you want to say a couple things, or um, maybe not on that one point, okay. but something close. Okay. Can I move okay. Um, <laughs> uh, as long as there's an opening, you're sure. Um. <laughs> so I, I thought it was sort of interesting. In looking across the panel here, um, I, I made some um, comments about how it was tough for me to think about doing service work, but I, I think that probably is reflected throughout the panel here that all of us, in a, in a way, wanted to do something that was more transformational or more s systemic uh, without losing that connection to the people that would ultimately be um, in, s in some way affected by it. And I, I, I also was thinking that um, about the two things that were important to me leaving Amherst, one was the politics, but the other was Buddhism. And I never became very spiritual, but the Buddhist class, the, the, the Buddha Bob and his classes here, uh, I hadn't thought about that, but they had an impact because one of the things they did was suggest that um, you really have to go inside first before you can um, start to change or, or work on change issues. And if you think about large-scale change and how we're going to uh, transform different systems, as Eva mentioned, it has to be the people that are affected uh, that are a part of that or are or, or leading that effort. And what, what I came across very early on uh, when I went down to Ecuador uh, on this oil case was that a lot of the people sort of accepted the fact that um, it was Texaco at the time, it was dumping oil into their water or spilling its waste into their water or their streams. And they sort of saw it as part of the natural environment. It wasn't something that you could change. Uh, it, it was a backdrop. Uh, and they, the first thing that we had to focus on, those working on these issues, was how do we change the way people understand their context so that they can then become activists in their own struggles. Uh, and um, I came to rights because uh, of the idea that rights is one way, human rights is one way to sort of spark that understanding that things don't have to be the way they look. Uh, and one small anecdote, and then I'll quit. Um, I was teaching at the time in Ecuador, and I was teaching a class of human rights, and, I, and half the class was um, folks from the military who would advance if they got a human rights certificate, and they weren't really taking it very seriously. And um, the military in Ecuador is generally a very hierarchical, non-questioning society. And I was getting more and more frustrated that these military guys uh, wouldn't challenge anything that I said. I was saying increasingly provocative things over the course of the semester, and they just went right along with it. And towards the end, I finally said, you know, um, what is it that you're going to get out of this class? What, um, 
how are you going to use human rights in your work? And uh, someone stood up and said, well, we really already practice human rights because we build the roads and um, we help keep people safe. And I said, yeah, but you can do that without human rights. How are you going to use human rights? Uh, are you going to talk about rights? Are you going to use this rights language? And um, one of them said, well, we can't do that because then people would come out into the streets and protest. And uh, I thought that was perfect because that's exactly why we, we use human rights or we talk about human rights is so that people will come out and um, become part of the uh, a movement and, and that they will then hopefully lead that effort. Thank you. And thank you for your question and your engagement. So we're going to move to the next three and then if time permits, we'll have a dialogue, and, but th the intention of, and the reason why we did these back to back was to delve deeper in the second session, so I hope some of you will be able to stay. So, Jeffrey? Hi, um, Jeffrey Wright, um, class of 87 as well, um, and uh, I've been in a couple James Bond movies, and I think <laughs> uh, those are transformative, so. <laughs> Totally jacked up my timing, Tom, <laughs> but it's not the first time. Um, uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, why it is that uh, I've gone from, uh, I'll talk about two things, how Amherst informed what I'm doing now and also how it is I came to go from theater, film, and acting to uh, mineral exploration and economic development in Sierra Leone. It's actually much more of an organic journey than it might uh, initially appear. But, uh, and I'm glad you're here as well, because uh, one of the things that we've tried to do through our work is kind of, uh, you know, I know we jest, but try to uh, really bridge the gap between commercial uh, interests and social advocacy and, 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 and recognize that there needs to be practical and pragmatic solutions uh, that involve, you know, all stakeholders in order to really have, you know, systemic change. So anyway, uh, I digress a bit. But um, so Amherst actually plays um, a, a really uh, very specific and central role in the work uh, that uh, I've been doing in Sierra Leone and uh, all of my work really, but, and, it, and it really stems from some of my uh, earliest and fondest remembrances of this place, and that was um, you know, waking up and heading to Frost uh, first thing in the morning and uh, to go read the New York, New York Times, which is what we had to do back then, as you remember. And uh, my, uh, the first articles that I would search for were article, articles about South Africa and uh, Soweto and, and Robben Island to discover what was uh, what was happening at the time, because as you, you know, as most of us know, that was, you know, uh, it was, no, it was good stuff. It, was, it all <laughs> turned out uh, really beautifully. Um, uh, because, you know, we were really looking for an issue to rally around at that time on campus, as many, you know, many of us uh, had come to, I mean, certainly I did, came to, uh, you know, college in the 80s, expecting to find, you know, the 60s in, in some regard. Uh, and we found uh, this issue of, uh, of uh, divest divestiture. And uh, which, uh, as I look back, uh, was an incredibly pragmatic response to a very complicated issue and finding the ways in which uh, there was an intersection between you know, social advocacy issues, issue, issues of so, social justice, and, um, and, um, uh, and, and commercial interests as well, and really finding a pragmatic solution uh, uh, to uh, applying pressure that has been, um, has, has been seen and reported to have been really effective uh, in uh, 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 bringing the downfall of apartheid. Anyway, so that was uh, uh, my, uh, my my studies in political science here. Really, from that point on, inclined toward Africa, and so um, uh, I started acting, <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, my some initial theater work that I did uh, leaned toward Africa as well. Uh, but my first uh, big film was a film uh, called about Basquiat, about Jean-Michel Basquiat. I was to go to the, the, the Venice Film Festival uh, with this movie, and it was the first time I was kind of having this entree into this larger, uh, you know, larger uh, film world. But I was always very suspicious of it. And so uh, I asked the producers of this movie to fly me to Dakar, Senegal, uh, uh, and I would make my way to uh, Venice a week and a half later. Because I, I'd never, I hadn't been to Europe before, I hadn't been to Africa, but I wanted to go to Africa first, kind of to retrace those genetic steps, and 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 then therefore from that point to kind of invade uh, Europe like a Moor. So, so I flew to Dakar, uh, and I just you know with you know a couple bags on my back, and uh, just kind of you know went to Ile de Gore, which is the you know the famous slave trading post there, and 
I played uh, a little djembe at the time, so I just kind of had this kind of, you know, in some ways a pilgrimage, really very moving experience, and just um, uh, just really went to, you know, to uh, to take that and to ground me in something a little more um, real before going into the, you know, stepping into this larger world of Hollywood. So uh, what I was struck by there was um, uh, kids with polio um, in the streets, um, like, you know, 50 years after Salk, and I, it was just, it was mind-boggling, and it wasn't the first time that I'd seen uh, poverty, but I'd, that I'd seen ways in which, uh, you know, this extraordinary debilitating disease um, was being played out when it had been practically eradicated in the developing world, and that was really struck me, among other things. Uh, but aside from that, on the other side, it was incredibly empowering, and I felt a sense of freedom there that I hadn't experienced before. Uh, anyway, so from that point on, I wanted to uh, I said, you know, put it in, in the hard drive somewhere that I'd like to re-engage and become deep, more deeply involved in Africa at some point. Uh, so uh, so uh, um, how much time do I have? Two minutes. Okay. So uh, cut to becoming increasingly disillusioned with uh, the business of filmmaking and, uh, and, uh, and, and the ever uh, more apparent Faustian nature of, uh, of, uh, of uh, that world. Um, I, uh, at one point, became kind of consumed with the war in Sierra Leone and started studying everything that I could about this war, largely because there was a rift between uh, the realities there and realities there, here, in that uh, the war, the initial narrative that I bought into that this war was fought over uh, access to diamond uh, producing areas, which is not entirely true. I'll get to that later. Uh, but at the same time, here, uh, there was an increasing fetish, fetish, fetishizing of the diamond on behalf of uh, urban kids, uh, you know, through hip-hop, bling-bling culture. And so uh, as this war was escalating, that interest was escalating on this side, but there was, no, uh, there was no correlation being drawn between the lives of these, you know, African kids on this side and the African descendant kids on the other. So I kind of got drawn into that story and uh, became consumed by it. I was actually working on a movie that was a complete fraud at the time, uh, a movie called Shaft, I'll say it, um, and uh, was pretty, um, I, was, I was pretty Time's undone up. by this experience. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, come, come on, I'm trying to free myself here. Uh, and so working on this movie, and uh, I saw a film about Sierra Leone called Cry Free Town, which is largely told from the perspective of young boys who were caught up in this, in this, in this war unlike the Blood Diamond movie, which was told from the perspective of a white South African mercenary. Um, uh, but it tells you something about um, the, uh, you know, the narrative structures that we, uh, as Westerners, buy into relative to the, to, you know, the actual stories. Anyway, uh, watched this film, uh, was blown away by it, really deeply moved, and uh, so a year, year and a half uh, after that, after becoming consumed with what was happening there, was working on another movie, a uh, similar story, uh, fraudulent story, in Mozambique, and the head of security for this film had gone to Sierra Leone to set up a security operation at a gold mine there. He's a former SAS uh, man, kind of a legendary figure in Special Forces world. Uh, he was intrigued that I knew a little, little bit about what was happening, and I was intrigued by him. And he invited me back to Sierra Leone in May 2001. There was a ceasefire at the time, about 17,000 UN troops in Sierra Leone. Uh, but I went just to bear witness to what was happening, um, really to read the newspaper again. And so that was my point of entry. Um, I'll talk about that later as well. But it was really from a ground level perspective and a very pragmatic perspective from guys who had been a part of this war and really uh, kind of educated, on me, educated, educated me about what service meant and about uh, uh, you know, what happens in uh, fragile states when uh, chaos, chaos uh, 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 sets in and uh, really opened my eyes ultimately to some pragmatic responses that we could implement uh, toward poverty alleviation and toward uh, restructuring the role of extractives uh, uh, so that uh, these extractives were not a resource, didn't represent a resource curse, but represent a catalyst for uh, long-term and sustained de development. So that's, uh, that's a bit so of So even as we're talking about equality, when you have an Emmy, you get extra time, right? Oh. <laughs> oh. I think it's just a function of being stubborn, Wanda. Uh, so, Tom, take it away. Oh, it, or is James? It doesn't matter. Just gonna, just one after. James Vaughn. Okay. I'm not, I'm not following. I, I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and yet you'll interrupt. <laughs> I'm the lucky guy who gets to follow Felix Leiter. 
Okay, uh, hi everyone, my name is James Fon, um, and I run a project called the Earth Journalism Network, and we support journalists around the world to help them cover environmental issues, and I'll, I'll talk more about some of the details of what we do in the second session. Um, but regarding you know my journey, I'd say it started even before uh, Amherst, actually when I came here for my uh, interview, my interview, my admissions interview, I had this great I can't remember his name, but I had this great interview, and we just ended up talking about the the interplay between science and humanities, and and it kind of and that's kind of a theme that's run throughout my career, including as a student at Amherst, I I, uh, I studied both physics and history, and I guess I always enjoyed uh, seeing how these you know how the science and humanities mix, and also at Amherst, I remember I was actually uh, I was on the uh, students advisory panel on divestiture from South Africa. And I guess I was a token white guy. Um, and, um, and that was like a, my first real life lesson in politics, you know, what, what really happens, you know, behind closed doors. And it was fascinating, a real learning experience. But anyway, so after graduating from, from Amherst, I, uh, I got something called a Watson Fellowship to do independent research overseas in, uh, on, on international collaboration physics. It was a fantastic experience. I went to Europe and North Africa, and I, I studied how scientists from different cultures work together and get along. Um, and I worked at places like CERN in Geneva, the European Space Agency, and the Niels Bohr Institute in, in Denmark. Um, and I guess by the time I was done, I realized I didn't want to do physics the rest of my life. Uh, but I did like the traveling. Um, <laughs> So I more or less worked my way and backpacked through the Middle East and, and North Africa and South, South Asia uh, for a couple of years uh, and ended up in Southeast Asia in 1990, uh, more or less out of money. And, uh, but I had realized along the way that I wanted to be a journalist and that this is a, a journalism is a great way to be a generalist, you know, so I don't have to specialize in just one field, but I could... Uh, combine all my various interests. So I sent in a resume to a couple of the English language newspapers in Bangkok, and one of them needed a science and technology editor. And that's how I got my start back in 1990. Uh, produced a weekly eight page section on science, tried to model it after the Science Times. You know, growing up as a kid in New York, I would read the Science Times every Tuesday, so I wanted to do the same thing. And I did that for a couple of years. It was, I, I learned all about journalism on the go, as you like. Um, but also during that time, it was a fascinating time in Southeast Asia. It was, Southeast Asia was undergoing a boom. Thailand was experiencing growth rates of about 12% every year, sort of like China in the recent past. Um, I think there was a statistic, something like one quarter of all the world's cranes, the building cranes, were, could be found in Bangkok. And everywhere you look, the skyline was just, it was an incredible time. A lot of energy, a lot of excitement, a lot of fantastic prospects for people. There were, you know, people were moving out of the villages and they were getting education and they were having great job opportunities. Meanwhile, Vietnam was opening up. I, I traveled to Vietnam. It was fascinating to, to, to see that country kind of um, reopen to the world. Cambodia, there was a peace agreement going on. So it was a fascinating time. Um, but it was also, I also saw some of the downsides of growth and uh, some of the way, you know, resources are overexploited. Just living in Bangkok, which is an incredibly polluted city with terrible traffic problems, you, you, you know, you couldn't even go make, you know, a spontaneous uh, plan to go meet your friends because traveling across town took, you know, literally two or three hours just to get, you know, a little bit. And, um, and you know, there are, lot, there are some other abuses too. I mean, people, you know, selling the children, unfortunately. And, you know, there was a lot of, so there are a lot of good things going on, but a lot of bad things, and I felt like, we should be able to have the good things without the bad things. And so I ended up becoming the environment editor for the newspaper. And again, this was a way to combine my interest in science and politics. And uh, put together a team of reporters, uh, Thai reporters, uh, covered uh, all sorts of issues, did a lot of investigative reports, uncovered log smuggling in Burma and hotel investors encroaching on national parks and oil companies dumping mercury in the Gulf of Thailand. Uh, ended up with a TV show uh, on Thai TV, so I was a, I was, again the token white guy, kind of, re, you know, uh, talking about these issues. It was fun, and um, and I did that for about a decade. Um, finally, 
decided it was time to come back home. I got a master's degree. I worked at the Ford Foundation. I worked. I, I wrote a book, shameless plug here, uh, <laughs> called A Land on Fire, about if anyone's interested in, about the environmental issues I covered and the adventures I had as a journalist. Um, and then the question came, what to do next? And um, on, and there's a, a story that happened. I'll just relate one more story. Um, when while as a journalist, uh, I went to Cambodia in 1992, right after uh, the peace agreement had been signed. And again, it was a fascinating time because the UN was administering the country, preparing it for democratic elections. Uh, and I would go to a restaurant there, and I'd see Chinese, Russian, and U.S. soldiers all sitting together having lunch because they were all there, um, you know, administering the peace. Um, so what I did there, I actually did some stories on environmental issues because no one else was covering it. Everyone was focused on the politics. And I did this one story on a Japanese aid package to, that was coming to Cambodia. It was for agriculture, and it, was gonna, it turned out it was going to include 40 tons of outdated pesticides some really nasty stuff, <laughs> like diazna. I was going to hook Cambodian you know, farmers for the long term. I wrote a story uh, for the Thai newspaper and also Cambodian newspaper. And for whatever reason, it kind of sparked student protests in the streets. The Japanese prime minister came on a state visit. And he actually held up my article at a press conference. And he said, we're going to stop these, these chemicals from coming. And it was incredible. You know, uh, it's an incredible lesson. Token white guys have value. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Don't underestimate your yeah. tokenness. Um, so, um, and I think that kind of taught me that you know the media can have a real impact, and that led to what I'm doing today, which I'll talk about later. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an honor to be on this panel, um, listening to these stories. Uh, my name is Tom Myers. I'm uh, general counsel and chief of public affairs for an organization called AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And um, uh, how Amherst uh, led me to this, I mean, clearly back in 1987, AIDS was just starting. Um, so clearly that wasn't, uh, it wasn't in my consciousness that this is what I would end up doing. But I, I ended up here. I, you know, I, when I came to this place, I bought the whole liberal arts ideal and Tara Seradian hook, line, and sinker. You know, the whole point of this education was to take it and go do something positive. Um, and I ended up uh, doing this work just sort of serendipitously. After law school, I was doing uh, was working to basically pay off my loans. This organization was a client. Uh, they had just recently gotten large enough and I guess litigious enough to uh, bring in their own in-house counsel. And that was back in uh, 1998, and uh, it's it, I've, I've been there for this long because I guess fortunately or unfortunately the organization just keeps expanding. Uh, when I started, it was based only in Los Angeles. Uh, now uh, we're in 22 countries, about 165,000 people under our care worldwide, um, and so uh, the the responsibility and the and the things that I do have just kept growing and growing and it's just become more and more satisfying because you're able to impact, you know, talking about the structural changes and things like that. Th that's what we try to do. Even though we, by uh, some organization standards, we're large, there are over 30 million people worldwide who have this disease. And, you know, we cannot touch them all. But if we can impact or affect uh, how much money is spent dealing with this, what it's spent on, uh, we can touch uh, all those people, and that's what I spend a lot of my time doing now. I'm based primarily in D.C., and I'm a lobbyist, um, but I don't have a bag of money, which makes it very, very difficult. Uh, but the, the point is, uh, you know, most of the money in the world for AIDS comes out of D.C., and if we can, again, influence how much, when what is to be spent on, uh, we can have a very, very large impact, and that's that's what I've been focusing on for the last seven years or so. So. Uh, Again, it was, it was just serendipitous that it was this thing, but I just knew coming out of this place that uh, that was the whole point of coming here. And the second part of it is in trying to deal with these issues, to think larger and think systemically and to think strategically. That was the you know the critical thinking that I got here is, is enormously helpful in doing that. So. That's it. Thank you.